Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Darby Love. I'm an adult services librarian with Vancouver Island Regional Library, and I am also a gardener. Um, always learning. I love coming to these because I've been able to integrate a whole bunch of uh, great science-based knowledge from our master gardeners and hearing from yourselves with your tips and places you like to get things and things like that, too. Um, we are here to talk about small space garden design. And uh, I'm coming from Nanaimo, Stonemo territory. And uh, you can acknowledge where you're from, the territory or uh, town that you're in, in the chat, because that's kind of a nice way to connect a little bit on this webinar setting. And we want to extend our heartfelt thanks for the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners. Uh, they've partnered with Vancouver Island Regional Library on this program for a few years now. And we're so grateful uh, that we can uh, bring out the best in each other and be more impactful together. And a big thanks to Joanne Canning, who's not in attendance today, but normally is, uh, for her key role in creating this program. And also April Ripley, whose camera isn't on, for uh, seeing the potential in this program and working with her. And then Richard Bernier, who's going to be presenting today. He is also the coordinator. He's done this job for, I think this is the third season. Yes. It's, a, it's quite a bit of coordinating. Adults are, are hard to coordinate. You do a great job. It's called a hoardery, a hoard, uh, hurting them. Hurting adults. It's very <laughs> difficult. Children are easier. Okay, so let's we'll just uh, talk a little bit about uh, housekeeping items. So we are recording the session today. Nobody's image or personal Im um, information will be captured in any way in the recording. And please make sure that you use the chat feature for things that are sort of um, in the moment. And you can find the chat box on the bottom. Mine has a six little red unread things and use the Q and A feature for uh, items that you'd like Richard to answer at the end. Um, and our two helper master gardeners, Deborah and Peter might prompt you to move something from the chat into the Q and A. Um, great, I think that's it. Okay, so. Now to introduce Richard. Richard is at all of these, so you've probably seen his face before and his beautiful Hoyas behind him. His gardening hobby started as a preteen when one of his elderly neighbors hired him, which was his first job, to help them in their garden. They showed him what plants were weeds and directed him to a vegetable garden that was in dire need of weeding. He gardened on and off until his teens when he discovered indoor plants. So he started his journey in plant husbandry the gardening bug had bitten him. Was it a spider mite? <laughs> no. After moving to the coast in 1994, he became enamored with the climate and developed a taste for exotic plants, both indoor and outdoor. Take it away, Richard. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the, the warm temperatures. Maybe it's too hot for some, some of you, but uh, it's better than the liquid sunshine that we get in the winter. Anyway, this talk is on small space garden design. And let's just go through a few things here before I start. Oops. Okay, small space garden design. Uh, uh, 2024, Vancouver Island Master Gardener Association and Vancouver Island Regional Library. This seminar is the property of Vancouver Island Regional Library and VIMGA Association and is intended for educational purposes only. Commercial use of part of this, part of all of this seminar is prohibited, prohibited without express written consent from Vancouver Island Master Gardening Association and VIRL. The information in this seminar is science-based and is accurate to the best of Vimgo's knowledge. Use of this information is at the sole res discretion, responsibility, and liability of the owner. Vancouver Island Master Gardening Association, Vimga is the chapter of Vancouver uh, Master Gardening Association of British Columbia, a member of the, an international service organization, specially trained volunteer teachers dedicated to stewardship of the environment, Master Gardeners work in partnership with public sector 
sector agencies, garden clubs, nonprofit service organizations, and private enterprise to teach, promote science-based, sustain, uh, sust sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. Some of the information, uh, images and information are from internet sources. Those are labeled or cited. And we thank the people, companies for the use of the non in this nonprofit educational seminar. All righty, so what is a small garden? It can be a balcony, it can be a courtyard, a side yard, an entrance, a terrace, pots, planters, hanging baskets. Now, when we're talking small space gardening, we're in within a large garden, you can have smaller spaces that you, uh, so there is no definite size to how small or how large a small space is. So that's basically up to you. Uh, my new air, my new uh, lot has a 60 by 15 foot side yard, and that will be my garden. And that's all I've got. So I am uh, planning it accordingly. Okay, first thing, what is the purpose you have for this space? What are you going to use this space for? Vegetable or fruits? Are you going to have them raised or in the ground? Is it going to be a place for you to relax and entertain maybe? Landscape, sports, like you can have a croquet field if you want, or a um, bocce ball. Wildlife, it's always important to invite wildlife into your garden. Now that could be hummingbirds, it could be a bird feeder. Hopefully you won't get uh, raccoons and deer in the yard though could be a view, just the view. A tropical oasis, this is right up my alley. Specialty gardens, like you could have an English uh, country garden in a small space. You have to know your space too. What are the dimensions of the space? If you're planning a large terrace and you want, uh, well, you're planning a terrace and you only have 10 by 10, well, that's as much space as you can use. You don't have any more space than that. So know the dimensions of your space and planning plan accordingly. How does this space face? Does it face north, south, east, west? North, it's gonna be darker and cooler uh, during the summer and probably cooler in the winter. Uh, aspect, you're done. Your climate zone. Now, if you're uh, in Qualcomm Beach or anything uh, anywhere on the East Vancouver Island, you'd be about an 8B. But if you have a pot garden where all the plants are in pots, you may be an 8B, but reduce your zones by two. So you're looking for plants that are hardy in zone 6B, right? Because they are not sitting in the ground, they're sitting in a pot and thus more prone to freezing the roots. Microclimates, microclimate, a terrace could be a very uh, small microclimate, uh, a courtyard because it's enclosed on either three sides or four sides that can increase the temperature and block the wind. So you have a, a space that's warmer in the summer and warmer in the wintertime. Soil conditions. What kind of soil are you dealing with? And this is not to do with your small pots and stuff like that, because you can vary that. But in the garden space that you have, if it's wet, well, you know you're not going to be able to put uh, dry plants in there. It'd have to be something that will accommodate uh, the roots being wet. And uh, not only the soil conditions, but also uh, is it like a sandy loam or 
play loan or, you know, talk to your neighbors. This is always a good point. Uh, if you're planning to plant a tree by the fence, then you might want to tell your neighbors that this tree might grow over on their side. And, you know, it, just be good neighbors when you're planning your garden. The surrounding space. Okay, if you're sitting across from a field, woohoo, you've got a view that's there for free. Uh, if you've got a corner lot, you have uh, more um, better sun because you're not having uh, houses right next to you. And if you're living next to a forest, well, of course, you're going to have probably quite a bit of shade. And keep in mind, forests do harbor critters. How many hours of sun do you get in this space also is rather important. For um, full sun, it's six hours a day. So if you have six hours a day of sun, then you've got full sun. Utilities. Now, this is really important, though. If you're gardening on a terrace or on a balcony, you don't have water, right? Uh, you might have electrical, that kind of stuff. So uh, plan for your utilities in the area, whether it be an outlet somewhere in the yard, uh, a socket of some sort, uh, water uh, hydrant somewhere in the yard so you can water and not have to pull a hose through. Now, what if you're not, if it's not a new yard, or a new property, then you have existing hardscape and uh, vegetation. Now, keep that in mind when you're planning your new space. Uh, if you've got a tree, try to keep that tree there. If it's a tree that you're interested in and has some um, all year round interest, seasonal interest, then keep it. Uh, same thing with hardscape, because these are all expensive uh, propositions to replace. Now plan your garden. Develop a site plan and add all the information gathered. So soil conditions, moisture, aspect, zone, uh, whether or not it's got its own little microclimate, all of these will have quite a bit to do with what you plant in your yard or your garden, your small garden. Plan for year-round color and interest. Now, year-round color and interest, evergreens. Some of them have the prettiest uh, variegation to uh, the the uh, the needles. Uh, you can plant rhododendrons, and they've got um, varied colors of flowers, uh, foliage. Uh, and actually some of the bark is actually quite nice too. It peels in the springtime. Texture and leaf size. Now, with texture and leaf size, not everything in the garden has to complement each other. So what I did in one of my gardens is I had plants with larger leaves in front and smaller leaves in the back, which gave a sense of, de of depth to it. You can also do that with color. Mature size of plantings. Yeah, if you've got a, an area that's 15 by 10, well, you're not gonna plant uh, a, a nevergreen that's gonna take up that whole space. So plan accordingly. Uh, know the, the mature size of the plantings or the plants you're planning to put in and uh, yeah, remember on the coast here, things grow quite a bit faster. So you can normally add about 15, 20% uh, growth. Let's say if they say in 10 years, it'll be five feet. Well, you can probably add an extra foot, maybe even a foot and a half to that. At least here on the coast, we have such a long uh, growing season. Line of sight. This is an interesting um, proposition. Have you ever walked into a garden and that's, you can see the whole garden just by walking in it? There's no interest, there's no secret little 
corners, there's nothing. So plan it so that when you walk into the garden, you can't see the whole thing, that there's maybe a bush planted in the, the uh, right in front of the gate or somewhere so that you have to walk around it. The, the sidewalk takes a walk around it so that you don't see where you're going, right? Uh, it's like planting a or planning a little seating area in the garden, a little seating area that maybe a little secret area. Board views. Uh, board views can be looking at a neighbor's uh, 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 Japanese maple. Maybe it's really pretty in the fall and you want to incorporate that into your uh, your uh, your line of sight or uh, board views or actually even the water. Uh, we had a property on the waterfront and we had a lovely view of a neighbor's garden as well as the water. So I did include some of these um, in my uh, presentation. Point of interest. Now, point of interest could be uh, could be a water feature. Um, could be something kind of out of the ordinary, um, like a plant that you don't see everywhere or that has a particular color to it or a modeling to it or uh, just really interesting leaf structure. Even grasses are nice because th in the wintertime, they will bend and move in the wind, which is actually adds interest. Art in the garden is always really important. You add interest, you add some personality, some of your own personality, whether it be a, a teapot that your mom had and you don't have any interest in using it, and use it in your garden. Put a, a, a viola in it or something. Or even garden art, like plaques on your fence or anything like this. Garden for senses, vision, smell, sound, texture, the feel of a garden. And here's a good point. How much time are you willing to spend in the garden? Uh, do you want it low maintenance? Do you want it a high maintenance garden? Do you want just uh, something that's natural? How much time are you willing to spend in it for upkeep? And the big one, your dollar, how much are you willing to spend? You know, uh, a small garden doesn't have to cost a lot. It can cost you, you know, like $10, $15 just by shopping at a, a, a dollar store or even um, like the Sally Ann or any of those or SOS for that matter. And yeah, there is no right or wrong in it. There's only, uh, not right or wrong. You're building this garden for yourself, not for other people. It's your garden. So you do what you want with it. But keep these uh, things in mind. Make your garden your own. And, you know, you go into garden and you can get a sense of what the gardener is like just by looking at the garden. If they're quite fastidious and there's no weeds around, well, you know, they're going to be in the garden pretty well every day. Uh, yeah, so make your garden your own. Okay, well, we were talking about lighting. And these were some palm trees in my other garden. And you can see they were back uh, bottom lit. And it does show off quite nicely. It gives that sort of tropical vibe. We did have Christmas lights going around the trunk that we lit up in the uh, festive season, which was quite nice. And it does produce a really nice focal point. All interest, all color. Now, that particular tree uh, was an Acer palmatum and uh, just lovely colors. It came out sort of a, a yellowish in the spring and then went to a mint green. And then this was the color in the wintertime or the fall. Incorporated view. 
in your landscape. This is my neighbor's garden and they had a wonderful garden. They spent many hours or actually had money and spent quite a bit of uh, time in it. And that's a board view, beautiful fall view. And um, there's a uh, Salish Sea in the background. Using color and texture to create a sense of depth. Now this was the front of our old home. And you can see that I did plant in front of the windows and I used different colors and different textures. The uh, large maple was um, uh, was um, Norway maple, uh, crimson century, and then the uh, small maple to the left side was a uh, variegated maple, uh, Acer palmatum. I don't quite remember the cultivar, and then there was some rotos in front. Line of sight. Now, uh, this was also in my garden, and you can see is a little path behind the. This was kind of shielding the greenhouse too, but behind it was a utility area. I had my uh, compost back there and stuff. So when you were sitting in the yard, you couldn't see it. It was hidden in the corner. Incorporate a multifunctional space. Now, this was a uh, potting bench I made. It was great for displaying plants on it. Uh, on it is, uh, let's see, I've got, yeah, that's uh, Fasciaretta, which is a uh, cross between uh, Fatsia japonica and uh, English ivy. And there's a couple of oxalis there also. And you can just barely see uh, a uh, red dragon, um, Acer palmatum red dragon. And you can see I added a little bit of art. There's a couple of crows in a pot on a little garden entrance. Dress up your garden entrance, make it intriguing so that it's inviting and, you know, there's pots there and everything else. Add another dimension. Now this is sound. Nice peaceful place to relax, have supper, invite guests for supper. And there is the sound of water. We had lights around the pergola and uh, some music too. Dress up your entrance, add some art. And you can see, I kind of dressed up uh, the front door. This was the front door of the old house. And you can see the different colors and textures there. There was some art on this end, but I guess I didn't quite capture it in the slide. piece of art in your garden, fall interest. My mom and my sister bought me this for my garden and I love it. It adds color. The birds have never nested in it, but they've looked at it quite a few times. I guess it was just too close to the, the fire pit and too many people around. Use of hardscape. These were uh, stone stairs going up to a, uh, a lookout and I just loved how the leaves fell on the stones and uh, were able to have that sort of fallish sort of look. And this doesn't have to be a big garden at all. Like you can do this kind of sidewalk in a small space. These just happen to be steps. Raised beds. These are also from my old garden. Uh, you can see I did them with concrete blocks. Nice thing about concrete, it doesn't uh, decay, holds the heat, and the soil does warm up quite a bit faster in the spring because uh, it's not quite as wet. The water drains right through it. 
and I raised them up to about, they were about three feet. So you could sit on it. It was about four feet wide so that you could garden fairly easily. And there was enough room to get a wheelbarrow around it. So again, plan for your, what you want, where you want it out of sight. Uh, you know, keep in mind that we're not, not all as young as we used to. So sometimes a raised garden bed is just ideal for uh, elderly gardeners. Or actually, if you've got a really difficult soil, it's all clay, doesn't drain or anything like that, then this is a perfect opportunity to break, uh, use a raised bed and uh, use that for your garden gardening needs. Potted plants for tropical vibe. This is also in our little courtyard. Uh, there's a tree fern, there's a bird of paradise, some clivias, and that is a uh, cycad. Adds a tropical vibe. And, you know, um, some of these plants you could keep under cover. I know the cycad would probably do good to about minus five in a covered space. Uh, the tree fern in a pot, not quite. You could probably keep it in the ground, but you would have to protect the top of the crown with it. Okay, now, these are some ideas from Gardening World on uh, small garden design ideas, getting the ratio right. The garden is, uh, for a small garden, you don't want all of it to be concrete. You don't want it all to be plants. You want somewhere to sit uh, and you want to be sitting within uh, the plants and stuff like that. So keep an eye on how much paving you're doing, how much paving or decking you have versus how much furniture you have. They suggest 50% uh, paving or decking and 50% plant beds. Cooler colors make a garden look bigger. It adds a depth and you can see the yellow up front adds a spot of light along uh, the back with the blues. Blues and purples will seem further away. Hot colors like red and orange will closer up and you can see that here, the, the yellow appears closer than the blues. create uh, height in narrow borders. Now, what they're talking about height is if you have ground cover, you can see the sides of the, of the garden so much easier. If you create more height, it gives more of a, a sense of openness without actually the, the walls of the, the house and the, the fence looking like a, a narrow, uh, breezeway basically. Combined seating and storage. Remember I had that uh, bench that I uh, built for a uh, potting bench. It had a sink in it and below it it had storage so I was able to keep my pots and my brush for cleaning the pots and uh, all my seeding mix and everything else in it. I didn't keep my seeds in there but you know, stuff that won't go bad in the heat or the cold. Long season planting. Now, long season is there are roses that will, uh, floribundas that'll grow, uh, that will flower all year round, or not all year round, but all summer long. Uh, there's other uh, shrubs, there's uh, perennials that you can get that will flower. Uh, longer periods. And uh, if you're just starting your garden, your small space garden, maybe put in some, uh, some annuals and dress it up. A hanging planter, plant up a hanging planter. Now on a uh, small balcony and stuff, you really don't have much, much uh, choice. You either have hangers or you have it hanging on the uh, railing. But 
that's also can, can be included as a small garden. Divide your space. Now, this actually is really good because it gives you an idea of the space. This front space was probably uh, used for uh, just plant display and everything else. And you can see they have a, a uh, terrace up here. So the, I imagine this is probably closer to the house and it's cooler and that's more in full sun. Uh, use light color, a colored landscape. That will help bounce light around so it doesn't look like a dark corner at all. And it'll bright up, uh, brighten the whole space up. You know how when you've got a dark space in your garden and you put something nice and bright in it, it just, that whole corner just sort of lights up. Well, it's the same thing with uh, chairs and that kind of stuff, like, and the, uh, the paving. Limit your planting palette. Now, I know we love colors, but choose a palette that goes together, right? That are all in the same, either hot colors or cool colors. If you mix them, it looks like um, a hodgepodge. There's no cohesiveness to it. Make the borders bigger. That way will give you, uh, you'll have a reduced space for lawn or patio, but you'll have more room for plants. You'll be able to plant the smaller ones up, up front, the taller perennials, and that gives uh, a sense of dimension, not only in height, but in depth. Makes the whole space look wider too. Add structural plantings. Now, structural plantings, what they're talking about would be like this tree and these uh, look like boxwood that are been clipped. So, and over here you can see there looks like a concrete monolith of some sort. So add some structural planting to it. Evergreen shrubs will give a permanent background, uh, backbone. So uh, you can see the pine and where else, anything else? Yeah, there's another, yeah. Oh, there's a uh, palm tree back there. Anyway, uh, like I said, use your imagination. Don't just get all uh, perennials or all um, deciduous, mix it up, get some, evergreen and some deciduous like deciduous you can get the colors of the fall leaves on the evergreens you get that green all year round use staging to fill in uh fit in more plants now this is a perfect idea i've done this quite well with my poyas i built staging for them and i can put them outside in the summer and they love it but uh this is a, a really pretty spot, like you've got uh, a couple of pots. This looks, looks like Loris nobilis, which is the uh, bay leaf and uh, geranium and uh, a few others. And a sitting area. Make a green roof. Now, what a wonderful idea to hide these recycling bins. You just built uh, a structure and put um, sedums on the top and it stays green all year round. And you really don't have to do much watering in the summer because these are all quite draw, drought tolerant. And like it says, it disguises or softens uh, functional features. Uh, make the most, plant up a shady corner. Now you can see in this, it's got, uh, Bleeding hearts, it's got some ivy. This, I don't know what that is. There's a Japanese maple there. So plant up. And that can be actually like a little garden. You've got a little garden bed, a little garden pot. Like I said, these gardens, they're your gardens. You do what you want with them. If you don't have the space, then this is perfect. You've got, uh, 
your this looks like uh, coral bark. So you'd have this in the winter time, the lovely uh, yellow green lime green leaves, and then this does go uh, quite a nice orange in the fall. Scented plants. Well, here's something after my heart. I have. I try to plant everything that's got fragrance in the yard. I've got rhodos that are fragrance. I've got Daphne that are fragrant. I've got um, Himalayan lily, uh, lily. That's uh, Cardiocrinum giganteum. That's flower. Uh, that the flower is uh, fragrant. So plant for senses, smell, uh, sound. Um, yeah. multi-seasonal trees. So trees with uh, more than just one season. Choose a small variety that offers uh, seasonal interest. And some of the information here, like you can plant whatever you want, but try to make it a multi-seasonal. Install a green wall. Now this, is on a brick wall and it's little pockets with dirt in it and they planted uh, some ground uh, ground covers in it makes looks perfect all you really have to do is spray it maybe twice uh, every two days and you've got a nice seasonal wall and some of this looks looks like flux and can't really tell the pictures are very really clear. Make a container display. Hang a basket. Add some height to uh, a patio or a balcony. Hey. Yeah, you can grow veggies in pots. And these are all, uh, looks like lettuce uh, and a few other uh, salad herbs. Another gross square meter veg bed. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, Planting by a square foot, gardening by square foot, where they actually give you a um, a template basically, and you just put it on your soil, and you just uh, you read on it. It tells you how far apart to plant different uh, seeds apart. Well, you can actually plant quite a bit in one of these raised beds. You can do successional planting. Like this zucchini towards the end of the season won't be as good. It'll be kind of leggy and everything else. So you could take that out at the end of the season and plant uh, a winter vegetable in there. Because uh, at that time of the year, it'll be getting cooler. And yeah, su successional planting. Choose compact veggie varieties. You're not going to grow big onions you can get them cheaper but if you want uh like small uh onions green onions or there's the uh egyptian walking onion uh small pumpkins there is also a small watermelon that uh you can grow in a small space spring radishes and you know a lot of these grow fast and you can harvest them and then replant, uh, especially here on the coast. Like we have an, really an extended gardening season. We can start gardening in um, probably March and go right through to uh, middle of October, even later, depending on if you've got a greenhouse or not. Work with your garden shape. In other words, if you've got a rectangular garden and you want it to make it not look quite as rectangular, then plant on the, the outside of the garden and make it uh, soften the edges of the garden.
use rectangular paving stones. Now this, what this will do will extend the width, make your garden look wider. If you were planting them the other way, uh, you would see where it would actually make it shorter, look shorter. This gives some length without actually adding any length to it. And you can see some nice planters there. These are uh, some ferns and that looks like a fatsia, maybe not more ferns. Save on shed space. And yeah, you're gonna have to store all this stuff. So um, here's some helpful hints on how to save space. Use the underside of jam uh, jars for labels, for strings, anything like this. Use repetition. You can see groups of threes, Groups of fives, sevens. Sevens pushing it a little bit, but groups of threes and fives is really good because uh, two doesn't make much of a statement, but three really does. Unless you're trying to uh, delineate a, an entrance, then you would want one on one side and the other on the other side. Or they don't even have to be the same. They could be two different. Spruce up your front gate. Now, this is a lovely gate coming into a garden and just by planting around it you make the garden more inviting ditch the lawn very important here on the island especially with our drier summers and the fact that if you want to put in 10 hours a week of watering cutting fertilizing, weeding a lawn, go for it. But they're not cheap, especially with uh, the, the dry, seasons that we, dry seasons that we've been getting uh, lately. I, in the new yard, will not have any lawn at all. It'll be all heavily mulched planting beds. And I'm actually quite looking forward to not having to cut a lawn anymore and dethatch it and fertilize it and demoss it and all of these other things. That's the one thing I miss about the prairies is the lawns. You can grow beautiful lawns in the prairies, but not so much here. Add lighting. Now you saw how I did the from the bottom lighting. It really does give a sense of drama. You can see how they've added Christmas lights to the tree just to warm up the space a little bit. And you can add solar powered spotlights and they are available. Uh, look for a good one though, if you're gonna get that because some of them will last a season and that'll be about it. The planning cycle, just um going over it identify what you want what the space is going to be use your due diligence in other words uh all of the things i came up with before like the size the zone the whether or not you've got the space for it, what you want to do for the space formulate an idea go through your uh your books look for plants the worst thing you can do is go to a, um, a greenhouse or a landscape supplier and look at plants there. Not a good idea because uh, you're going to come home with something that's not quite right for your, your garden or your, your aspect or your uh, zone. So do formulate an idea and Make sure that what you're planting is good. Uh, study and uh, look at the colors, look at the textures and all of that and make it happen. Now, a garden is not static. It changes through, um, through the years, through the seasons, not only the, the seasonal change, but the, the height and the shape of your garden changes. So keep it real, uh, keep it under control, and uh, yeah. And that's it. That's it for me. It's, oh, well, about 16 minutes. 
Uh, these are some of my uh, references. The last 30 slides were from Gardener's World, How to Maintain a Garden, Small Garden Design Ideas. Uh, this is a good book, Small Garden by Noel, uh, Noel Kingsbury. Uh, the Garden, RHS, an iBook app, which I'm a member of the uh, RHS, so they have an app on your book and you can look up all kinds of stuff on there all kinds of great hints and everything else. And the Sunset Western Garden book. This is probably one of my Bibles. That and the Encyclopedia of Garden Plants are my favorites. And with that, I'm done. Great, thank you so much, Richard. You're welcome. I'm sure everybody's feeling pretty inspired. <laughs> There I am. Well, uh, yeah, keep it real. Keep your garden yourself. Make it you, you know. And like I said, there's no rights and wrongs. Just know your stuff ahead of time. Now, do we so have... So there was uh, one question that was answered already. Okay. So the question, uh, but you probably have something to add to, is, um, oh, and just by the way, Peter is uh, an intern master gardener. So he is here getting the sort of uh, sway of things in our sessions and perhaps we'll convince him to do his own session sometime too. So thanks for being here, Peter. Um, okay, so the person asked, is it a good idea to have plants growing in a window box attached to a wall? I wonder if little critters from the plants or soil might decide to start nibbling the house and or if it's a potential fire hazard. So, yeah. uh, okay. Would be a nope. fire hazard, a fire hazard at all, depending on how big the box is. I don't imagine you're looking at a big box on your uh, hanging on the window, but uh, no, you're not really you're not going to use soil from your garden to put in this window box. I would suggest you, especially in a window box, that you use uh, an all-purpose soil, uh, sterilized soil. That way you're not introducing weed seeds into your garden box and you're not inviting in any little creatures that might be inhabiting the soil and now you've got them in your window box. Uh, the only other thing about it is you're going to have to water at least once a day and fertilize at least once a week or use a, um, a an extended release fertilizer. I had window boxes and the watering thing is very true. And then, of course, my mother-in-law gave us um, little cypresses that were tiny and then turned to be three feet high in front of our windows in these tiny boxes. So things might do unexpectedly well in your window boxes that you hadn't hoped for. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Peter had said two window boxes are great to add color to your home. They don't normally attract bugs that will do damage like camp carpenter ants or termites. Yeah, Peter, you can unmute yourself. It's just chatting, so, and Doug too. Okay. You got anything to add to that, Deb? Um, I really liked uh, Peter's answer about the critters in the window boxes because the kind of critters that are going to uh, be attracted to your house and want to nibble on your house, uh, they don't live in damp soil and they're not they're not going to be in your window boxes. So I don't think that's going to be an issue at all. There might be some insects that end up living in your window box, but they're more interested in the plants and not your house. So that that really, I don't and think that's... Basically, if you use sterilized soil, you're not going to have that problem. You, you, you might get some pill bugs in it and stuff like that. But carpenter ants, you're not going to get them in your window box. Uh, you're not going to get... Um, What's those other little bugs that eat wood? Termites? Termites. You're not going to get termites in there at all. They live in the soil and they like it damp. So basically, if you got your window box up quite a high, you know, they're not going to build a little tunnel up there to get to your window box to eat your box. No, they're more interested in anything at ground level where they can reach the wood and they can chew on it there. 
And as far as, as uh, fire uh, danger with window boxes, I think your window box is just, it, it, it's going to act like it's part of the house, actually. I don't think it's going to be separate. Like if you've got a, a tree or a shrub that's kind of close to the house and, you know, uh, that can act like a sort of a torch with fire. I don't think a window box is going to do that. Mm -hmm. For one thing, the plants in your window box are probably going to be smaller they're not going to be big like a like a, a shrub or a tree that can act like a torch with fire. So and you can probably you probably have things that would be hanging from it. You know, you're not going to have like grasses in it, like tall grasses or right. anything like that. It'll yeah. be all proportionate. So you probably plant uh, what uh, geraniums. You could put impatience. You can put anything depending on you know the aspect. If it's facing south or east or west or north. You know, these are all things you have to take into yeah. account. But it's not going to act like like shrubs and trees close to your house, no. like underbrush. And it's not no. going to act like that at all. As long so. as you don't plant those cypresses like I did, you <laughs> should be okay. <laughs> those go up like torches. Yeah, they're they're really out. big. <laughs> did, you, did you move them? Did you take them out of the window boxes? I think we eventually killed them off by neglect, oh. tired of watering them. Yeah, the, the, a window box is a commitment <laughs> if you want it to is a commitment. Alive. Strip irrigation. Yeah. 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 Um, with me, everything's in pots, so it does take a while to water everything. Yeah. Don't do it to yourself. <laughs> yeah, it gets old fast. Yeah. So we got uh, three more questions there. Mm -hmm. um, Peter had sort of jumped in on the comments on dwarf blueberries in pots as well. Yeah, they will do uh, fairly well, but they do require a fair amount of moisture and they do like, uh, they don't like hot, hot sun, but they do like a, a fair amount of sun. So the only problem with that is uh, watering, right? Because they do require water. And if you let them dry out even once, well, there goes your berry crop, right? So uh, you can, and I've seen it done. All about your dedication, I guess. Yeah. So you both agreed on rich soil and plenty of water. Yes. Very good. Good job, Peter. Yeah. Peter, talk up. <laughs> well, I typed in the answer. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. easing in. Uh, okay. All right. So are potted plants in two... Um, why are they two zones? Two zones colder than in the ground. Yeah. Because you talk about they, that. they freeze. The pots freeze. They actually freeze. We don't get ground frost here. If anything, maybe the first half inch, maybe inch or so freezes on the ground. But in a pot, it's out in the open. And, you know, it becomes the ambient temperature of the air around it. So, you know, and not all plants are root hardy in our zone you know uh like there are some um what in particular uh dahlias you can leave them in the ground you can't leave them in a pot because they will freeze in the winter time gladiolas are the same thing you can leave them in the ground but if you put them in a pot or so you need to Keep in mind that they will freeze and they won't reflower for you. So it's all about the fact that there's no protection. It's out in the open and there it is. So like I said, uh, I've lost a few things this last winter because of the, the cold that we had. It was unexpected. And some things that were hardy here died. The roots died on me. So, yeah. One one thing that you can do to sort of help that or or uh, uh, mitigate the the uh, effect of the coldness when it's in a pot is make sure that that root ball does not dry out over winter because if the if the soil is damp and the freezing temperatures come in the water in the soil kind of freezes but that holds it right at freezing or just below yeah. if the soil is dry then the temperatures go right through and freeze the roots and they're not protected right at freezing, which plants that are in zone 8A or B, which is what we are, 
would be fine with a little cold on their roots. But when it gets down, like I had minus 11 in my yard last winter in uh, Cumberland. And I lost a few things. I lost, uh, yeah, things in pots because you have to make sure they don't, the root ball doesn't dry out. So <laughs> a way to, to do that is uh, about once a month, I would just um, put it in my calendar to remind myself to go check the pots that I had pulled under the patio for the winter, use a moisture sensor and see if they needed watering because I've lost things in pots from, from the root ball drying out over the winter. The other thing you can do is like put it up against the house, put it under cover by the house. If you've got patio doors, you can put it right up against the patio doors outside. And there is quite a bit of heat coming from the patio, the doors. So these are all things you can do. I've grown uh, musabanju, which is the hardy uh, Japanese uh, um, banana. and I just bring it the whole thing into the the garage, cut off all the leaves. And these are a few things that need to be dry. A banana, if you're going to overwinter it, keep it dry mm -hmm. and dark. Uh, Brugmansias, dry. Take all the leaves off, put them in the, in, uh, the garage. Just keep it above zero. Uh, Alocasias or calocasias, same thing. Keep them dry, and they will do quite well in the uh, in the garage. And if you have dahlias in pot, you don't have to unpot them. Just bring the whole pot and put it in your greenhouse or your your garage. I dry store a lot of my bulbs and my uh, heart, not half hardy perennials. Anything to add, Peter? Canas. We, I always um, cut my canas right down and put them in pots with a light dirt and put them in the garden shed at the garage for the winter, take them out of the garden and that keeps them well. So yeah, all the others are the same as what you've already said. Yeah. Right. Great. Um. Would the tropical plants you suggested be okay in an unheated greenhouse on the east coast of the island, Comox Valley? Yeah. How close is the greenhouse? Is it out in the open? Or is it uh, up against the house? Uh, is it got double glazing? Is it uh, polycarb? Is it insulated glass? Or is it just single pane? Now, if you want, you can get just one of those little ceramic heaters and that'll keep your the frost off your greenhouse in the wintertime. Just set it on a, a, um, um, a thermostat and just set it around zero and then basically it'll keep the frost. It doesn't have to be a big heater because we really don't get that many really cold, cold uh, days. So basically, it's just at night, just keeping it uh, around two, three degrees. Yeah, so little things, big impact, it sounds like. That's great. Little things, big, big impact. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. So we have another question from Wendy. Do you have any suggestions on places to get modern garden art on the island, individual designs? Hmm. Found items. Found items? Yes. A wheelbarrow. <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, you can get uh, teapots and plant plants in them. You can get uh, an old uh, you know those old, ma uh, not mason, but those old uh, crocs. But you can plant a water garden in it. So, you know, use your imagination. It, it, it doesn't have to be fancy. Oh. Go ahead, Peter. No, I was just going to say things like driftwood, as you say, found things. So driftwood and that, you can cut holes in it and plant small plants in it, especially ferns and that, like that. And... So it's easy to, um, any kind of wood 
Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, Jan Dwyer just said uh, marketplace, because there's always something that you can find on marketplace. Uh, yeah. Like what's, what's your treasure? Maybe somebody else's junk. Right. So if you if you find a plaque, we, even a, a metal plaque that you really like, get it, put it up on your fence. I'm just sort of thinking uh, I I almost got somebody's random, you know, like old singer sewing machine that goes in the table. Right. Um, but my partner was like, why don't you like spray it down with some sort of sealant? Because because you're like, well, I don't want to put it out in the garden. It'll like rust and like whatever too right do, do any of you have any experience with doing something like that yep i do i uh you know those barrels those old oak barrels and the stays that are on them like the the metal stays yeah. well i collected them all because my barrels only last five or six years or actually closer to 10 they're wood rotted but i've got all these these round metal things and i'm gonna put them all together and make um, a globe out of it right you are know? you selling any modern garden sculpture items that people should know about no <laughs> no you, I, you can I, be create creative is what you're telling people yeah just be yeah. creative like i said there's no right or wrong it's your garden and you do what you want to just keep in mind all the stuff that we we've gone through tonight right Deborah yeah. had a suggestion for a, a market. Did you want to tell everybody, Deborah? Um, yeah, there's a hand a curated handcrafted uh, market happening at Paradise Plants north of Courtney. Hmm. I believe it's this weekend on the 13th. I don't know specifically all of what the types of vendors that are going to be there, but at least one of the vendors is uh, she's a master gardener who lives in uh, Black Creek, I believe. And she does all kinds of garden art. She makes original garden art. She does glass. She does uh, other things with uh, concrete and clay. Uh, she's quite creative. But, and there might, given that this is at a nursery, I suspect there will be other vendors there that are doing garden art. So it might be a, a, a good one to check out. So yeah. it's one of the things, I'm going to go. I want to, I want to see what's there, so. Has anybody ever seen a pair of jeans stuffed with dirt and yeah. plants growing out of it? Yeah. Uh, the, or an old boot. An old boot with a plant, with growing, a plant out growing out of it. Those, that's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Any of that stuff. Like, you can do all kinds of neat stuff. Yeah. And, you know, open your mind. <laughs> Think of. Yeah. Well, and, and just a cautionary tale about garden art. Um, about 15 years ago, I fell in love with this beautiful bird bird bath sort of thing that had been sculpted. It was a, it was a woman's face and it had uh, glass rocks glued in and then it had a beautiful cup like this. It was gorgeous. I paid $300 for it and it was beautiful and I loved it, but I wasn't told that it needed to be brought in in the winter and I left it out and it just disintegrated. It took a few years and, and it's, it's just, it just fell apart. So be careful when you buy garden art, that if you're going to spend a lot of money, make sure that it's going to last in, or that you're willing to bring it in, you know, over the winter, which I'm a bit lazy in that regard. I don't like stuff I have to do that much fussing with. So it was a lesson learned for me. What I found is I found um, a pallet and somebody made a pallet garden out of it they actually put a backing on it and each one of the cross members became a pocket they put a bottom on it and then they had strawberries growing down it mm -hmm. so uh, like a tiered layered effect mm -hmm. which looks quite pretty and actually you provide yourself with some nice fruit tender fruit too one of the attendees suggested checking pinterest for diy That's ideas too that's, that's a idea. really good idea pinterest yeah. is Yay, really internet funny. yes what did we do before internet no. um there's a question in the q a about non non self-seeding grasses um i don't have at the top of my mind particular varieties that don't self-seed 
But I do know that the internet is a great resource. And I think if you just type in non-self-seeding grasses, you'll come up with, with choices. I mean, I know there are ones out there that don't like, I don't know, I can't think of any right off the top of my head, but some self-seed terribly and they become a real pest in your garden. So that's a really good question. So are you are you talking about the lawn grass or are you talking about ornamental, ornamental grasses? Ornamental. Yeah. I'm the sure, one sure. thing about ornamental grasses too, they spread. Unless they spread they're the yeah, well, unless they're not self-seeding, they don't spread as fast. No. I think they're no. they're much well, more easy to control if they're not Scamphus gigantus or any of those. They don't seed, but I tell you, the rhizomes are like bamboo. Well, I have Miscanthus sinensis in my garden, and it doesn't spread by rhizomes quickly. I know. I know it does. Beautiful. It's actually a smaller grass, smaller, um, finer grass. The Gigantus is huge, grows yeah. about 10 feet tall, and okay. the the uh, they're almost the size of your pinky, the, the thickness of the, the stalks. Yeah. Well, I learned my lesson as a as a brand new gardener 30 years ago about Mexican feather grass. I thought, oh, this is so pretty. And within three years, I had it everywhere. <laughs> I was ripping it out. <laughs> yeah, true enough. Yeah, I just didn't. Well, know. It's, again, it's about doing your due diligence. Find out, uh, look up the plant, make sure it's not one that's on the invasive species list and talk to other gardeners that have it in their in their garden. You know, like there's all kinds of forums on Facebook. Uh, there's Gardening on Vancouver Island. There's Garden Fanatics. There's all kinds of forums. There are groups on uh, Facebook where you can get, you can ask questions or you could talk to uh, Milner Gardens, the uh, the uh, plant, well, what is okay. it? Okay, what, what, what you're trying to remember, Richard, is the <laughs> Milner Gardens garden advice line which That's is where you email in questions any kind of gardening questions and then these questions are answered by teams of master gardeners uh, and it's um just a uh, google garden gardening advice line and it'll come up with the email address or you know what i can put it in the chat let me let me get it in the chat and make sure that i have it right for you uh it's it's a, it's a great service through Vancouver Island Master Gardeners. And there's also the garden advice parties. If they have a small garden or something and want sort of an idea of what to do with it, and those are called GAPS, garden advice parties. You wanna give them the email to uh, um, request one of those? Do you know what it is? GAPS no. at vimga.org. Okay, gaps, G A P S, mm -hmm. at vimba, vimga dot org. Right. Okay. Starting advice. And do we have another couple of questions? We had a follow up on the non self seating. Okay, I think that was already answered. Uh, HCP. Hmm. So are any of you planning a new garden? Or have a garden that needs work? I just put the uh, email for the garden advice line in the chat. So, okay. Yeah. It's a great uh, service. Free, free garden advice. The person who put HCP uh, elaborated horticulture center of the Pacific to see plants. Right. Yeah. There is actually an infertile fountain grass that you can get. So there's one type that will not self seed. Ah, Good to know. Oh, do you mind typing that in the, the chat, Peter? Sure. Now we're all really curious about non-self-seeding grasses. No problem. Yeah.
It doesn't look like we have too many questions tonight. No, I think with the uh, the weather, we've had a little bit of a smaller group, which is totally fine because uh, the recording will be kept in posterity for for all those who want to watch it later on. Yeah, so if you have friends that have missed this, or if you're interested in a different uh, topic, uh, we'll send out the back catalog of all the sessions. There's a uh, climate smart gardening. Uh, we've got specific things like all about rhododendrons, veggie growing, lots of topics. Hey, we have a comment from uh, Susan. She's in the process of revamping her front yard into a hosta garden. That's Beautiful. Amazing. Hopefully you don't have deer in the neighborhood. <laughs> that might be a little bit... Uh, difficult and hopefully it's got shade because no, no deer, deer is Toronto, Toronto. <laughs> that sounds pretty safe yeah it does is it uh a north facing garden just while we're waiting to April is going to pop up the questionnaire um, which includes where you're joining us from. We just like to know a little bit about you because we can only see each other and it's uh, great to, to know more about what your level of gardening is, et cetera. So we'd be delighted if you answered the poll. Lots of shade from a gorgeous red oak. Yes, north facing, wonderful place to plant hostas. There's all sizes. Oh, you can get them as large as almost four feet which is uh, Empress Wu. There is um, some in substance, which is kind of a light uh, green and is quite a large leaf. There's anything from tiny little pastas like uh, mouse ears. Uh, there's uh, white feather, which is a really quite white leaf. Ah, uh, yeah, lovely. And there's actually a hosta that is fragrant. It's um, Royal Standard. If you can find Royal Standard hosta, it will take some light, some uh, full sun, and the flowers are very, very fragrant. There's, uh, that's, yeah. There's also a golden standard, which is also fragrant. Patriot is good variegated, yeah, also. Yeah, on the chats, there's another question that got mixed in there and was asking about climbing rose. It only blooms once, and can you give it a, a good prune after it's finished blooming? Yeah, actually, it's, uh, it's a good time to prune it after it's finished flowering, prune out the the old flower buds, uh, the old spent flowers. I wouldn't really prune at that time though, not unless you want some fresh growth that may actually uh, have problems in the winter because basically what you want to do is you want the wood to harden off so that it'll go through the winter. And if if you cut it back, too late in the season it'll try shooting up new buds and those new buds will actually freeze so uh, i know uh deborah is quite uh an avid uh pruner sure. <laughs> would you agree with that deb that you um, do it in the winter uh, well yes i would uh but maybe for different reasons i i actually uh, discovered this year quite by accident I have two climbing roses in my yard. Both of our heritage roses from starts from family members that if um, you prune everything in late winter, early spring, right to the ground and all the new growth, I have lots of wonderful new growth and no flowers. So you do need to leave some branches for next year or you won't have any flowers. That's That was a hard lesson I learned there. Uh, the other thing is if you prune right after blooming, it kind of depends on when the blooming finishes. Like if the blooming finished now, it would be fine to do some light pruning to prune it back. Uh, you could even prune it 
a little harder because we do have quite a lot of time until first frost for it to for it to grow and harden off from yeah, July. That's that's August. here on the island, but anywhere else, yeah. your climate right. would actually be the uh, the factor that you'd have to look into. Right, exactly. The other thing is um, it, the the thing about plants when they're growing is is if you prune something when it's in its growth stage and its growth phase, it'll put out new growth. And then if you if that happens too close to a frost, then that new growth will get frostbitten. But if you do your pruning after the plant is sort of shifted out of the growth phase and into the phase where it's storing food in its roots, it won't put out a flush of growth and it'll be fine. It can be tricky to figure out if you're in that stage or not and, and do some research on your particular plant to see if you can figure out at what point in the summer does it stop putting out new growth and start shifting over to storing food in the roots for overwintering and for next year? If you, it, it's a fine line. If you do it, if you do, if you prune soon enough, the new growth has time to harden off. If you prune right at the wrong time, there will be new growth and it won't harden off and it'll get frostbitten. If you prune a little bit later, there won't be new growth because the plant is not in its growing stage. I know that's a, that's a, you know, it could be this, could be that kind of answer. So I think you probably need to do some research on your particular plant. Also, when does it stop blooming? Yeah, that's if it's a floribunda that flowers all year round, well, then it's not really, you're not really pruning, you're pruning off the flowers, the, the spent flowers more than anything. Yeah, right. that's. Deadheading is different than pruning, yeah. you're just cutting off the spent flowers. And that's a good idea to do that, to cut off the spent flowers right from the start. Because if there's a lot of um, rose hips forming, the plant will, print. will, will not, you. it'll put its its strength into, into those and making seeds rather than making new buds. So if you want it to continue to bloom, you'd need to deadhead it. Not all plants respond that way, but roses, it's really, it's really helpful to keep it blooming longer if you deadhead and cut all of those spent, the, the rose hip part, you know, the little bulby thing at the bottom where the petals attach. Uh, it's very helpful to keep it blooming. Okay, we had a comment here. I recently moved to a large garden, but I'm planning on splitting it into some small garden rooms. I love the idea you mentioned of creating excitement by making travel through the space rather than you see everything straight away. Thank you. I'm trying to plant a narrow 10 by 20 long shade garden that is not fenced. I have deers and rabbits. What do you recommend? I have pears, Japanese grass, pulmonaria. So far, deers are munching on the astilbes, I, so I never get flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Look at what's growing in the wild is probably your best bet. Uh, long shade garden. They won't eat um, hellebores. And hellebore has all season uh, interests. It has the evergreen leaves in the wintertime. I normally cut my leaves back in, let's say, January, and then the flowers show up about a month later. Uh, Ferns, they won't need a lot of ferns. ferns. Yeah, there's yeah. ferns. Anything that's got a fuzzy leaf. Or, or it's highly scented. Anything that's highly yeah. scented, they don't like that. Daphne? The, the, the um, Sunset Western Garden book Great. has a section on uh, deer resistant plants. You, what you need to understand is there's really nothing that's deer proof. If deer are hungry enough, they'll they'll taste or eat pretty much anything. There are some things that they will, I mean, they don't, I've never seen them eat daffodils, for instance, no. but they'll, they'll eat things in the winter that they won't the rest of the year because they're hungry. So, but, but find a, a West, Sunset Western Garden book or find a book on deer resistant plants or look for a website on deer resistant plants and see what's listed there that you think you like. Hey, uh, there's other plants that you could put there. Uh, what is it? Uh, just had the name one. Scented evergreen skimmia. 
Deer won't eat skimmium. Okay. They've never eaten mine. Uh, and it's quite pretty and has uh, four, seas, uh, four season uh, interest. Uh, if you get a female skimmia, then you have the red berries. Male skimmia are really quite fragrant, the flowers in the springtime. So, you know, it's not that you can't grow a lot of things, but there are things that you can grow. And skimmia really don't require a lot of light. You know, they not deep, deep shade, but, you know, bright shade. They'll do quite well. Yeah. Were, were you trying to say something, Peter? Well, I was just going to add uh, things like dwarf rotos and dwarf azaleas. They don't, they won't bother them because the size of your garden bed is small. You don't want, you want to make sure what you're buying is not going to, one roto could take up that whole bed, you know. That yeah. Is, the so other thing is uh, Daphne's, Daphne odora, which is quite pretty plant. It's green all year round and lovely fragrant flowers in the spring. Uh, there is actually another Daphne, which is eternal fragrance that flowers later on and is just flowering in the garden now and wonderful scent to it. And it doesn't grow into a huge tree either. It just grows, you know, like maybe about three feet high and maybe about three feet wide. And uh, another, another nice plant that has very, very fragrant flowers in late winter is Sarcococa. It's, yes. it's a bit of an unprepossessing sort of gray green hedgy looking thing the rest of the year but the scent of those flowers in the window in the winter I had some along my front porch in my previous house and it was it was so lovely to walk up the walk and come in the front door to the scent of those flowers in January and mm -hmm. it's and it's slow growing it's not going to invade or take over it, it's and, very slow growing and the flowers are so inconspicuous yeah. you wouldn't know it's flowering basically they're but, tiny yeah really tiny but they'll and fill your garden with scent They're just amazing such a lovely smell yeah richard there's um a question in the chat that's probably for you it's um you said to you said to buy a good quality solar light for up lighting and and this person would like to know how will i know and what price range well if it's built from, out of plastic it's not going to last very long <laughs> But if you if you go and if it's built out of metal and uh, it's actually got a, a, a good solar panel on it, not all of them have the panel on the light itself. You can get some that have a panel that sits on a fence and then there's a wire going going to the the uh, the the lighting itself. So it doesn't have to be fancy. But at the same point, you don't want to get something that's cheap and plastic that won't last, right? So you'll end up buying it um, every year to replace it because all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. So uh, I wouldn't give you um, a manufacturer, but if you look online and look at uh, what people have said about the, the products and stuff like that, then... Uh, that's what I would use myself. I have uh, low voltage lighting, which is uh, needs a transformer and everything else. But like I said, if you're just on a patio deck, just get a cheap solar light. You know, you don't need anything too expensive. But if you're if it's a larger garden and you want it to last, then, you know, also depends on how much money you've got to spend. <laughs> right. And I think that's the big one is how much money. So you're not going to give a price range is what I'm hearing. <laughs> uh, I would, no, no, I'm not going to give a price range. It depends on the item too, wouldn't it? Yeah, it depends on the item, who makes it, where it's made from and everything else. But if there's four of whatever kind of light, probably the cheapest one is not a good buy. It. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, you know, you can always do a search uh a Google search and find out what people have said about it. Again, do your due diligence. Yeah, it's hard, hard to get stuff that lasts, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, somebody would like you maybe in the chat to spell the Saracotta scented bush. Oh, Sarcococa. Sarcococa. Uh, I will do that. I'll put that in the chat right now. I'm glad you're doing it because I can't spell it. <laughs> Great. I smell it. I love it but I can't spell it. 
Uh, I think it's got two R's. So, it, yeah. it does have two R's, I believe. S A R R C A C O C C A. That's it. Or something close to that. <laughs> that should get you the right plant. Yeah, it should. Sarcococa. Yeah. It's also called Sweet Box. Yeah. Which you could look at. And up. there are different types. Some grow yes. taller, some are smaller. Myself personally, I like the smaller one because. It didn't grow all over the place. It was nice and neat. It filled in a border along a, a sidewalk, which was quite right. nice. Yeah. Some have dark purple berries and some have red berries. So. And you can plant other plants in with it too. Yeah. One of my favorite plants. And I have no shade in my yard, so I can't have it anymore. <laughs> can you make some shade? Not really. We're, we're working on it. Treats it bigger. Anyway. True enough. Yeah. We have run through all the questions. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Richard, for the presentation and Deborah and Peter for fielding questions. We really appreciate everybody's time and attention. And uh, we will send out a follow up thing through Eventbrite, just reminding you of where you can find the previous gardening videos there on our YouTube channel, but you can also go to the library's website, virl.bc.ca slash gardening, and there's info on our seed libraries there too. So we've tried to make it a one-stop shop for all of the library's plant-related stuff. So coming up on August 12th is A Year in the Orchard by Joanne Canning. She uh, and another master gardener went and over uh, a couple of months actually did some tours of um, an orchard. So that's coming up on uh, August 12th. So save all of your questions for spots on apples for next month. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Darby. Thank you, everybody.